Uh, today, our first speaker will be Andrew Gordieu, who will be talking about uh, the complexity of hybrid quantum classical computation. Welcome, Andrew. Okay, thanks, Shelby. Um, can you see my slides okay? Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so as Shelby said, I'll be talking about the complexity of hybrid quantum computation. Um, so, oops. Okay, I can't. Okay, there you go. So this is joint work with um, Arturo, Andrea, Matt, Utam, and Hendrik. Um, so kind of very similar to Adam's talk, if you attended that, I'm going to start by first defining a few models of computation. So I'll start with just um, the class of problems that you can solve with quantum circuits of depth D. So as you can see here, you, know, you have some problem that you want to solve, you encode the input to the problem as qubits, say in the computational basis, and then you apply a circuit that has D layers of gates, and then you measure the output qubits to get the result for your problem. And two comments here, so one is that this depth, the depth of the circuit D, is scaling as a function of n, where n is the size of the input, and we should think of it as, um, you know, very short depth circuits. So the depth is, say, logarithmic in n or polylogarithmic in n, maybe even constant, something like that, but definitely not polynomial depth. So these are supposed to be shallow quantum circuits. And the second comment is that I'll refer to the, um, okay, I can't, okay, there we go. I'll refer to the set of problems that we can solve in this model as Q sub D, and you should think of these as sampling or search problems, again, using Adam's terminology. Um, so these are classes of search and sampling problems that we can solve with quantum circuits of depth D. And I'll kind of comment towards the very end of the talk why we don't consider decision problems and only look at search and sampling problems. Okay, so if we have a quantum computer that can run circuits of depth D, Obviously, we can just repeat that several times and combine it with classical computation. And this is our first hybrid quantum classical model. So the idea here is that you have a classical computer that can invoke these D-depth quantum circuits several times, and then you know, do some classical computation based on that run another D-depth circuit and so on. So it's very similar to how variational quantum algorithms work, where you have, say, a parameterized quantum circuit that you run measure its output, then classically compute some gradient function to update the parameters and run a new circuit, and so on and so forth. So again, like the class of sampling and search problems that we can solve in this model, I'll refer to as CQD. Uh, so this is a bit of you know more unconventional notation, but I hope it makes it a bit more intuitive and also like self-contained for this talk. So now there's also a dual to this class. Um, which is a quantum D-depth circuit invoking a classical computer. So what this means is that now imagine that your quantum computer has the ability to do intermediate measurements after each layer in the circuit. And you, know, you can measure some of these qubits, feed the results into a classical computer that again runs in polynomial time. And based on that, you can reinitialize these qubits or you can change, say, the gates that are being applied to the unmeasured qubits. And you do this again for like D layers of depth. So you're kind of still limited to D layers of depth, but you can do these intermediate or mid-circuit measurements. So you know this is something that we eventually have to do to implement fault-tolerant quantum computers, because these would be like, say, the syndrome measurements and corrections in an error-correcting code. But in this talk, I'm assuming that these circuits are noiseless, so there's no noise whatsoever, and I'm just kind of viewing these mid-circuit measurements from the computational perspective, like what computational advantage can we gain by doing this in this regime where quantum circuits are very shallow. So again, the corresponding class here is QCD. So finally, uh, kind of the way we went from Q sub D to CQD, if you have a quantum computer that can do this, you can just repeat this polynomially many times and combine it with classical computation. And this gives us the last model, which I'll call CQCD. And you know, in principle, you could keep going, like you could talk about QCQCD and so on. But we argue that beyond this point, it doesn't really make sense because if you go beyond this, you would need a quantum computer with very long coherence times to do anything more involved. And at that point, you might as well be doing like polynomial depth quantum circuits. So, you know, there are more standard names for all of these classes uh, that you can see here, again, for the regime where the depth is polylogarithmic in N. But again, for the purposes of keeping things self-contained and hopefully more intuitive, I will continue with this Q, C, Q, Q, C, and so on notation. 
Okay, so what we're interested in understanding is, you know, what are the relationships between these classes? Like, what is it that each of these models can solve efficiently that maybe the other models cannot solve? Uh, you know, how do we compare and contrast these things? And one thing that we kind of notice immediately are these like simple containments between the classes. So clearly, if you have classical computation in addition to D-depth quantum circuits, you can do more than what you can do with D-depth circuits alone. At this point, we don't know if it's strictly more. We just know that this is more general. Similarly, CQC is a more general version of both CQ and QC. And finally, even if you had the ability to do polynomially deep quantum circuits, then you know you could just subsume the classical parts of CQC and just do everything quantumly. So this is kind of what we notice immediately about these classes. But we would like to know more than this. Like we would like to know, for instance, if these containments are strict and how, say, CQ and QC relate to each other, things of this nature. And as Adam kind of mentioned in his talk, there are you know these complexity classes that can be quite strong, for which we can't really hope to prove unconditional separations. And so any separation we would show here would have to be based on a computational assumption. And I'll get later to what kind of assumption we're willing to make. So first, just a little bit of motivation, like why do we want to understand these hybrid classes? Um, you, know, you can find more about this in the recorded talk. But one reason is because many interesting quantum algorithms, we know that we can implement with just short depth quantum circuits. So for instance, Schur's algorithm or the algorithm for solving Pell's equation, you can do with just log depth quantum circuits in the CQ model and even constant depth quantum circuits in this like mid circuit measurement model. And, you know, partly inspired by this, um, Joza made this interesting conjecture in 2005 that maybe all you need is just short depth quantum circuits. Like maybe that already solves everything that you would be able to solve with just general polynomial depth quantum circuits. So, you know, in our notation, this would mean that the CQC class with polylog depth circuits is equal to BQP. But, you know, not everyone believed this conjecture, and in particular, Scott Aronson had these. 10 semi grand challenges for quantum computing in 2005, uh, when he was asking, like, can you prove an oracle separation between these two classes? And can the oracle then be instantiated somehow based on some computational assumption? Um, so let me just kind of you know, explain what I mean by this. So this oracle model of computation or black box model means that in addition to what you could do before, like to whatever gates you could do before, you also have the ability to invoke some function f. So, for instance, for the quantum circuits, you know, you have the circuits that you had before, but you also have a unitary that can evaluate some function f, and you view this as having unit cost. So you view this kind of like as if it was an elementary gate itself. And you're kind of asking, like, um, you know, what problems can you solve being given access to this function f, and, you know, how many queries to this function do you need in order to solve the problem? So you, know, you can define all of these complexity classes relative to this function f, so being given access to this f. And so like one way to interpret um, Aronson's challenge is, does there exist an f in an associated problem that you can solve in BQP relative to f, but not in CQC relative to f? So CQC would need, say, super polynomially many queries to this f in order to solve the problem. So this was shown to be the case um, in the series of works by Chia Chung and Lai and Kudron and Menda in 2020. So they showed that indeed you can construct oracles that separate the hybrid models from BQP. So strictly speaking, they showed it for CQ and QC, but you can easily extend the results to CQC as well to show that they're strictly weaker than BQP. Um, and the kind of intuition for the result was that the oracle has a very special property, like you consider a very special function, and this property that it has can only be discovered by querying the oracle both quantumly and sequentially, say, a linear number of times. So the fact that you have to query it quantumly means that the classical parts of the hybrid aren't really giving you any useful information about the function. And the fact that you have to query it sequentially a linear number of times means that the quantum parts do not have sufficient depth to learn the property of this function. So Intuitively, this is how you can rule out um, these hybrid models for being able to learn the property of this function. And that's kind of the problem that we define is, you know, uh, tell me if the function has this property or not. So, you know, there was this follow-up work by a subset of the authors of this paper 
um, where we showed that you can also separate these two models from each other relative to, again, these special oracles. So you can come up with problems that you can solve in the CQ model, but not in the QC model, and vice versa. But, you know, one inherent uh, limitation of all of these results is that the functions have to be very structured. So they need to have this special property, um, and, you know, we refer to them as structured oracles. Um, we also don't know how to instantiate these functions. Where by instantiation, I mean that, you know, you can give me a, um, a circuit that implements the functionality of the oracle. And, you know, you would like to show that the separation still holds when you're being given the circuit, but then you have to make some assumptions. So, for instance, maybe the function is periodic and you're assuming that the period is ha hard to find classically or something like that, which we know how to achieve by assuming factoring is classically hard. Uh, so we don't really know how to do that um, in these cases. And there's like an extra complication when you're considering depth separations, which is that even if you come up with an instantiation of this function, that function needs to have low depth to, you know, to allow for these hybrid models to even be able to query the function in the first place. Um, because you're defining this problem and you're saying, you know, even if these models can query this function, they cannot solve that respective problem. So the question then becomes like, how do we, you know, address all of these limitations? And what we argue is that one way to address them is to try to prove these results in the random oracle model. So the random oracle model is, again, like one of these oracle models where you're given access to a uniformly random Boolean function. So the function now is no longer structured or special, it's just a completely random function from the space of all functions. And so this is called the random oracle model. And, you know, very briefly, um, the random oracle model was considered in complexity and cryptography because it allows us to prove interesting things while relying on very unstructured assumptions. Uh, so, you know, the random oracle is inherently without structure because it's a completely random function. But nevertheless, we can show that relative to a random oracle, p is not equal to np. We can construct one-way functions from which we can build other cryptographic primitives. But interestingly, this doesn't let us do everything that we would like to do in cryptography. Uh, so, for instance, we cannot construct public key cryptography from the random oracle, even though we know how to do it for more structured assumptions like, say, factoring or the learning with errors problem. So, you know, this kind of would address this uh, limitation of having a structured oracle because now you have something that is inherently structureless. And regarding the instantiation, um, in practice, what people do when you have, say, a protocol or some complexity class that's defined relative to the random oracle is you can say, I can substitute the random oracle with the cryptographic hash function. Um, and in practice, it, seem, it seems like this really works well. Like, it seems like these hash functions do behave like random oracles. And the nice thing about them is that they can be implemented in low depth. Uh, so this would kind of address all of the limitations that I mentioned on the previous slide. Okay, so now, finally, I can tell you a bit about our results. Um, so what we showed is that relative to a random oracle, and for any depth that is like less than a polynomial, we can prove first that, um, you know, this um, D-depth quantum circuit model is strictly weaker than these two hybrids, CQ and QC, which themselves are strictly weaker than this CQC model. So it's kind of intuitively what we expected from the picture that we saw before. And furthermore, we can also show that CQC is strictly weaker than BQP, again, relative to the random oracle. And thirdly, and uh, to me, this was really the most interesting of the results, um, is we can show that also CQ and QC are distinct from each other, but in a very interesting sense. Um, so in the sense that, for instance, if you look at this separation, it's saying that there's a problem that you can solve in this QC, so this mid-circuit measurement model, which is constant depth quantum circuits, that you cannot solve in the CQ model, even if you have quantum circuits of depth D, where D could be, you know, much larger than constant, like it could be polylogarithmic or something like that. Um, and similarly, CQ with constant depth can solve something that QC with even polylog depth quantum circuits cannot solve. Um, so this is kind of saying, like, at least this uh, first containment is saying that these mid-circuit measurements in the regime where you have low depth they can really give you a computational advantage. So they can allow you to do things um, that you wouldn't be able to do if you didn't have mid-circuit measurements, provided, again, that you know, you're limited anyway to doing short-depth quantum circuits. So if you look at the picture from before, you basically get that um, you know, all of these containments are strict, 
And furthermore, that these two classes are distinct from each other. So they're really solving incomparable sets of problems. And again, because we can base these separations on the random oracle, we can actually get like concrete problems, like concrete instantiations for these problems by using cryptographic hash functions. So we also get um, another thing out of this. It's not like immediate from this previous result, but it's something that um, you know you can get by combining with other results. Is what's called a proof of D quantum depth protocol, and this was the notion that was introduced by Chia and Hong. So this is a protocol for certifying that a quantum computer is performing circuits of high depth. So the idea is that you know you have a quantum computer somewhere, which we'll call the prover, and you have a classical computer, which we call the verifier. And the verifier wants to check that the prover is performing high depth computations. Um, so the verifier will send a challenge to the prover that the prover has to respond to. And it should be that if your prover can do like very high depth quantum circuits, then it will be able to correctly answer the verifier's challenge. Whereas no prover that is doing low depth quantum circuits, even when you combine that with high depth classical computation, um, is able to correctly answer the challenge. Um, and we get exactly something like this. So we get a protocol that's, you know, two messages in this way. Um, and, you know, this condition that no low depth quantum circuit can succeed in this protocol, you again get it in this quantum random oracle model. So like relative to a random oracle. Okay, so let me conclude with some, um, you know, like an overview of this area and some interesting open questions. Um, so, you know, the main takeaway of this work is that it gives you like unstructured separations between these hybrid models in contrast to the previous results that were structured separations, so relative to structured oracles. And so it's given the refutation of Joseph's conjecture in this random oracle model. Um, and again, like to me, an interesting takeaway of this work is that um, if you have the ability to do these mid-circuit measurements, they can actually give you a computational advantage. So you know they're useful not just for fault tolerance, but maybe also to solve problems that you couldn't solve without mid-circuit measurements. So let me comment a bit on why we didn't talk about decision problems. So th the answer is actually very simple. It's because we can't really hope to prove these results for decision problems relative to a random oracle. And that's because of something called the Allenson and Bynes conjecture, um, which essentially says that you can't really separate even classical computation from quantum computation uh, relative to a random oracle, like polynomial time classical and quantum computation. So, you know, if you can't do that in the random oracle model for decision problems, there's no hope to do it for the hybrid models either, um, because, you know, you can't even separate classical and quantum. So in some sense, if, if you want to get separations relative to the random oracle, and you believe that this conjecture is true, you're kind of forced to look at sampling and search problems. And for decision problems, your only hope is to look at, you know, more structured separations and maybe like more involved um, cryptographic assumptions to, to give you those separations. Um, so we also got this uh, proof of quantum depth as a result of, um, of these separations. And, you know, kind of tying back to, to this question of structured versus unstructured, um, you know, one interesting question is, can we base these separations on more standard cryptographic assumptions? Uh, the random oracle is not really that standard, like, you know, it's a nice assumption to make, um, but really it would be interesting if we could base this on something like, say, factoring this classically hard or the existence of one-way functions or things of that type. Um, so this seems very difficult to do because we don't even know how to separate like classical low depth from classical high depth. Uh, from standard cryptographic assumptions. So for instance, like the class MC that you heard about in, in Adam's talk, to separate it from P, um, we don't really know how to do that from standard cryptographic assumptions, even if you assume something very exotic, like homeomorphic encryption or indistinguishability obfuscation, we still don't know how to do that. So it seems like you know you would have to first resolve the classical case before you begin to address the quantum case. Oops. Um, you know, there's also the question of, like, can we come up with natural problems to separate these classes? Because the problems that we consider were fairly unnatural. Um, and, you know, as I said, like, you could keep going uh, with these hybrid models, like, look at something like CQ, 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 and so on. This might not be interesting from a practical perspective, but maybe it's interesting theoretically somehow. And finally, you know, one limitation of our proof of depth protocol is that 
as far as we know, it really relies, it, it really requires polynomial depth um, on the quantum prover to succeed in the protocol. And it would be nice if you had a protocol where to succeed, you only needed quantum depth D plus one. So if you have depth D for your quantum circuits, you cannot succeed. If you have depth D plus one, then you can succeed. Uh, so this would be like a fine grained proof of quantum depth. And currently we don't really know how to do that. Okay, so with that, I'll stop here and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. So yep. We have time yep. for some questions, but I'm, we have to toss the mic away. Sure. Okay. Hello. Oh. Um, so, in your assumptions, uh, I think you should uh, make uh, some quantum. So, sorry, I can't. I can't right, hear so, you very well. So you're going to have to ask your question, and then I'm going to have to repeat it for the speaker. So if you can make it kind of as simple oh, as possible, okay. so I can repeat it, that would be great. Uh, Great, thanks. Uh, so in your assumption, you you require some quantum oracle queries to the uh, to the oracle and the random oracle. But I think uh, uh, in the low depth uh, circumstance space, uh, you need a, a, it's hard to make a coherent query. So how much of your results hold if you can only make a classical queries to oracles? So the question was, if you could only make classical queries to the oracle, would your results still go through, or do you really have to make coherent queries to the oracle? Oh, I see. Um, yeah, so you, you do require um, having to make coherent queries to the oracle um, because, so interestingly, we, we do rely on this property that we call um, classical query soundness. So this just means that you have a problem that you're not able to solve if you're restricted to making classical queries to the oracle. Um, but you can solve if you can make quantum queries to the oracle. So this was kind of the basis for, for showing these separations. Like we can't really get it without this property. Thank you. Any other questions? Sure that, Another yeah. question? Uh, hello. Can you say more about the fast floating Hamiltonians in the natural separating problems on your slide. Sorry, one more time. <laughs> on the slide, there's like, are there natural separating problems with fast forwarding Hamiltonians? Can you say more about the, that question and how do the, you- The fast forward, forward Hamiltonians? Yeah. Uh, the question was, could you say more about that open question about the natural separating problems and fast forward Hamiltonians? Right, so, uh, so I should say that I don't know too much about this. I know there have been some works on, on, this, on this topic. So the idea would be to try to come up with some sort of natural problem that separates BQP from these hybrid models. And one candidate seems to be this, uh, technically would be non-fast forwarding Hamiltonian. So the idea is that you have some Hamiltonian and you want to time evolve a state by that Hamiltonian. And the question is, can you somehow fast forward the time evolution? So if you know your output state would be e to the minus i h t acting on say the L0 state or whatever, the question is, could you get that output state or like measurement statistics from it in time that is significantly less than t, like maybe logarithmic in t or something like that? And I know there are some results showing that for certain, like for many families of Hamiltonians, this should not be possible. But I don't think those were, strictly speaking, separating BQP from the hybrid models, just BQP from this Q with low depth model. Um, so one would have to extend this to allow for like classical high depth computation as well, that even that cannot simulate like fast forward this Hamiltonian evolution. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll end it there, but you can continue the conversation on Discord if you have more questions. Thanks, Andrew. Great, thank you.